Mark and Joan have been doing a remarkable thing, which we're going to talk a little bit about and then uh, engage you in uh, discussion, reflection about as well. Uh, in their different realms of activism and citizenship and engagement, uh, though their political perspectives are starkly different, their methods, their ways of seeing problems, their approaches in the way that Annie was, was just describing of asking what's upstream, and asking what the structural roots are of the ills that uh, we aim to, to remedy uh, through our activism, in those senses, they are actually quite remarkably similar. Uh, and Joan has, in uh, recent months, catalyzed and launched an endeavor called Living Room Conversations. We're going to talk a bit more about this. On your tables, uh, there are sheets uh, of information about Living Room Conversations. Uh, but as it sounds like, it is simply this format in which Someone who is either from the left or the right hosts a conversation in their living room with some friends on their own side, but then inviting an equal number of friends or new, new friends from the other side. Actually, can I? Yes. So let, let me just, let me just uh, set that up and say we're going to talk a bit about living room conversations and about how it is that Joan and Mark uh, have uh, begun to model and to practice what it is that they're preaching about creating cross-partisan conversations and practicing the art of listening and engaging as citizens. Joan. So, thank you. Well, what, it, what we're talking about is co-hosting. And Mark is a friend that I co-hosted a living room conversation with in January. And I do live in Berkeley, so sometimes when I suggest to my friends that they might consider co-hosting a living room conversation, they say to me, but Joan, I don't know any conservatives. <laughs> and I say, that is to some extent one of our problems, and I bet you know someone who knows a conservative. Though I will also add, many people go, oh yeah, on Facebook, I have these friends from high school, or I have these <laughs> friends from college. And there have actually been some wonderful conversations brought together through Facebook. And you know, when you, you get together 10 years later with your high school, and it's actually my friend Elisa had a conversation with a Tea Party leader in New Hampshire, which is where she came from. And that was another great conversation. But Mark is actually a friend of a friend of a friend. Well, I was only two steps removed from Mark. And he even lives in my state. So it's like, hey, Mark, come on down and have a, actually, we, we were on the phone friends and email friends for well over a year, maybe yes. close to two, before we decided to co-host a conversation. And it is a very simple format where you just find one friend that will co-host. It has a different view, and it doesn't have to be political views. It could be an issue you're trying to deal with. And then you each bring two friends. And I'm really glad you have the sheets on your table because it's very simple set of guidelines, sort of like what you learned in kindergarten, or be respectful, listen to each other, be curious, and take turns. Very easy. So you hosted one of these uh, in your home, in your living room in Berkeley. Uh, Mark, you attended. Yes. Um, you each had some friends. Um, uh, it was a remarkable conversation. It actually made front page news in the San Francisco Chronicle. That's, that's how rare it is in it's American a good politics picture, today. Right? Yeah. Um, sells newspapers. Sells newspapers, you know. Um, but uh, uh, describe for you, Mark, uh, uh, what it was like to get invited and then um, the process of entering into this living room conversation. Sure. Well, you know, Joan and I have been talking for over a year on the phone and by email. So we'd been developing a trusting relationship for quite a while. And for me, I live in a small community in Northern California up in the foothills above Sacramento. And it's literally this bipolar community. It's two cities next to each other, Nevada City and Grass Valley. Grass Valley is a very uh, sort of rural, ranching, mining, timber community. Uh, Nevada City is an old hippie town. It's an awesome artist community, lots of music and arts. And so I sort of have spent the last 20 years straddling those cultures. I owned a coffee house in Nevada City. All the punk kids in town hung out there, very avant-garde music and poetry. So to me, I was really comfortable in both camps. And through my foray into the Tea Party movement, obviously that's, you know, it's definitely a right-wing conservative movement, and I had a bit of frustration in that movement with the vilification of the left. And so I heard this, I'd go to Tea Party meetings and hear this, and, and then when I talked to my friends on the left, I'd hear the same exact thing. I mean, it was 
frankly, craziness and irrational on both sides. And so I've always been frustrated by that. And I've always reached out cross-partisan. In fact, literally my dad, going back 15 years, we had a group in town that we used to call, my dad's nickname is Bubba. We called it Bubba's Sit-Around. It was a couple of our little liberal friends, a couple of conservatives. We'd sit around and drink beers and solve the world's problems. So this is the <laughs> precursor to living room conversation. We never that, did anything. That's a good brand. I like that. Bubba's Bubba sit around. around. It's not great. In Texas, that sells really well. <laughs> so, but, you know, we learned to have respectful dialogues because these are people that we live with. These are friends of ours. These are people who came into our coffee house. So, when, when Joan came up with the idea for Living Room Conversations and brought it to me, I mean, it just made perfect sense to me. Now, she's pretty brave to invite me into the Berkeley Hills. I mean, look at me, right, number one. <laughs> number two, if you've ever been to the Berkeley Hills, the streets are pretty narrow. It's a really beautiful place, and I drive a Ford F-350 Dually pickup <laughs> that's lifted, right? So I warned her, I'm bringing the pickup. Do you need to meet me at the border of Berkeley with the Prius to get me in? <laughs> She assured me I wouldn't be stopped. So I get to the neighborhood, the neighbors come out, right? They're looking, they can hear my truck coming half a mile down the hill. I have to bump in between a couple of Priuses to park the thing. I'm sure your neighbors protested after I left. They said, oh, I saw you in the paper. That's why the big truck was there. <laughs> I was worried about that. That's why Wes gave me that look when I met him last night, huh? So, you know, but we had this extraordinary conversation where I brought two friends and Joan brought two friends. And, and the primary initial topic was crony capitalism. I mean, who in America likes crony capitalism? Nobody. Well, not nobody. I mean, the folks in D.C. like crony capitalism. But who among the rest of us, left or right, is a supporter of crony capitalism? So this was a pretty easy subject for us to embark upon. And there are much more difficult subjects, but that one, there's widespread agreement. And it led to a discussion of getting into specifics, Glass-Steagall, and how the repeal of Glass-Steagall was really bad for the average citizen, you know, getting into banking regulation. And then the conversation just kind of veered around wildly. And we got into a lot of things where there's common ground. It led us into a discussion of criminal justice reform, which we found there's incredible common ground left and right. I mean, who in this country thinks our criminal justice system is working well and the war on drugs has been a tremendous success? I mean, you could go ahead and raise your hand if you... <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. I haven't met anybody at a tea party that thinks so either. Isn't that amazing? But we have the status quo. So here what we found is you could get a group of very diverse people together, diverse political views, diverse in every way, who would normally think, oh, those people on the other side are just crazy, sit around, eat some home-baked goods that my wife sent for us, and Joan's hospitality, <laughs> and realize, oh, these are great people on the other side. So... I understand between the two of you, there was already this foundation of trust. Uh, and, uh, but the friends that you brought, I don't know whether they had known each other or... Uh, so how, what was it like initially um, for you to set a tone? How quickly or not quickly uh, did your friends follow the pace that you set of trust and engagement uh, in that conversation? Well, the living room conversations are very structured in order to make it a safe place. The pilot project was on energy slash climate change. And all those conversations were successful. We've had them about immigration. We've had them about m money and politics. We've had them about gay marriage. And the first hour is, why did you come? What are your values? They, you know, what are your dreams for your community? Who are you? And by the time you're done with that hour, you know that these people you're sitting with are smart, you like them, and then all of a sudden you hear what they have to say when you get to the first content part of it. You hear them in a completely different way because you want to have them be happy too. You want to be, you share core values. I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of spending that long in a conversation on these questions. Who are you? What are your values? What are your dreams? Um, that are, quote, not political, right? They are, they are the deeply personal questions. Um, the goal, of course, of Living Room Conversations is not necessarily, perhaps not even at all, that you come out with consensus or that you come out with agreement or a joint action plan or kumbaya, you know, we, we, we love each other, right? The, the point, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that you simply learn to disagree in a more human, uh, agreeable uh, civil way. Is that, is that a fair way to put it, uh, Mark? I mean, I think ideally, 
we, we like to find common ground. If we can, that's an extraordinary gem at the end of the trail, and, and it gives us things to go further with in other conversations. But if we don't, the reward is, is just the humanity itself. It's, it's stopping this process of vilifying each other. You know, I was sitting at the, the table back there, and the, the why question that came up that we all really seem to have impact on almost, why do the politicians and the media figures want us to hate each other? Like, it just seems to be pervasive. It's both sides of the aisle, right? So there, there has to be a why. There's something going on there. And, and I argue that it's the politics of hate. They're, it's very profitable for them to have us hate each other, right? I, I don't care who I talk to in Washington, D.C. There are a few exceptions, but the majority of people I talk to there, staff or electeds, they want me to hate the other side. And I, don't, I just don't come from that place. And I think when we come from a place where we understand and empathize and care about the other side, well, we're more likely to find that common ground. And that being said, we're not actually, one of the things that I think makes unique what Joan and I are doing, we're not telling people come to the middle and find compromise. I don't, I don't think either of us are big compromisers. I think we're looking for consensus and places where we agree, where we can actually fight side by side and push back against the system in those areas. And then we'll agree later on to go back to our own corners on certain issues and lace up the glo gloves and duke it out in the public arena. We trust the system to allow us to do that. Right. And what you're describing is a public <coughs> arena today that lacks the first part. It's just all about the stage duking it out right. without the first uh, understanding uh, on a human level of, uh, of where people are coming from. Jo Joan, for you, as you've started doing these, and, and, and you yourself are hosting a bunch, but you're encouraging others as well, tell me a little bit about the way in which this has uh, been amplifying uh, around the country. Well, we did a pilot project, and last year was early adopters. The, I mean, coming from the space of Move On, I'm a mediator by origin, and I'm very clear that the solutions we come up with collaboratively are eons better than the solutions we come up through adversarial methods. And hence, you know, here I'm having conversations with Mark about crony capitalism and, you know, criminal justice. But my big issue is actually climate, like many people. That said, I recognize that even though I think there's going to be agreement across partisan lines, it's a big problem within a couple of years. We're going to be equally as effective dealing with it as we have been with the budget, with health care. <laughs> yeah, we cannot afford to continue in an adversarial um, stance with each other. And I've seen that DC and many capital, state capitals are in such a dynamic that they can't fix it through Move On and Moms Rising, I've come to understand that citizens are smart, they're caring, and I believe they can be leaders. So the dream is that we go from the early adapters to massive adaptation for any issue people really care about. And that's why this is a wonderful lead up to this conversation for me is, you know, you're talking about you have to do what you care about. That's absolutely true. Have a living room conversation about it. We got the guides right there. It's an open source project. Use it however anyone wants to. And then feed it back to us because, you know, think Wikipedia too. We're, we're going to be constantly learning from what others do and hopefully we'll yeah, you know, we have a startup website, but it will become magnificent where everyone feeds in information and we build community and have this virtuous cycle of offline to online engagement. Well, what I actually want to do for a moment right now is, and it's, it's not something we've done yet today, is ask everybody in the room not to have a conversation, but just to silently, personally reflect and write down on a piece of paper, I'm going to spend a minute or two, who in your life you would like to engage in a living room conversation um, and who it is that you think you could construct this kind of space with uh, and, uh, and then we'll come back. So we're going to do about a minute for this. Um, there is adversarial conversation. There is conflict or it gets hot uh, in one of these living room conversations. Ha what, what do you do? Well, it's a shared responsibility. You know, you, in the guidelines, you all take responsibility for the conversation and so it's kind of a wonderful place to be where people are being genuinely themselves, 
but everyone I've had conversations with so far, and things have gotten hot, and you can verify by the conversations you have, but they haven't gotten to the point where they're disrespectful. You know, you don't want to take the heat away, but you want to create a foundation of respect and listening. And if you can hold both those things at the same time, you know, the, the value and genuineness of the conversation. And Mark, you were saying as well that language matters, right? The so I think language matters a lot, and I think this is a fundamental mistake that we all make. I've certainly made it plenty of times. You know, if you watch MSNBC versus Fox, the, you'll hear different language. I mean, it's extraordinary. We're all speaking English, and we don't understand each other because we're using English differently. So when you go into these conversations, I think one of the things that we have to do is to um, sort of keep in mind the buzzwords that really agitate the other side. So I'm gonna give, I'll give you like a trick for talking to your right-wing friends like me, right? <laughs> and so it's not the concept, it's the language, because the concept is misunderstood. But if you say the words social justice to somebody on the right, they don't ever hear anything you say after that. Like, it's done, right? I can tell you what they hear, social justice, blah, 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 I'm a crazy progressive, blah, 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 right? That's what they hear. I can guarantee you that. If I say to people on the left, states' rights, what they hear is, oh my God, racism and slavery, blah, 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 <laughs> crazy Tea Party guy, right? So I don't, you know, I don't come in and into a room like this and say that, and that's respectful. You know, we, we have, as Americans, this reputation of being the ugly Americans abroad. We're pretty good at being ugly Americans at home also. <laughs> So we need to be respectful of these cultures within these communities. So th this is something which hopefully we'll draw out as we hear from some folks around the room. Uh, but th you know, one thing is being mindful of language that can be a landmine um, and, and not you know, activating that. Uh, but I wonder whether over time as we engage in these living room conversations, we can actually transcend that and, 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 uh, and say, well, why is it that you actually respond the way you do to social justice uh, as a phrase or to states' rights as a phrase uh, and let's unpack that, right? right? Uh, because that, that's the, um, the, the that, that I guess is the 202 level of a living room conversation. The 101 is just in the first place figuring out how to hear each other without it all becoming just the kind of the, the red blindness of rage as, you, <laughs> as you're set off. Well, one of the specific examples was from my conversation I co-hosted with Amanda, my conservative partner for starting living room conversations. And it was on, it, uh, we were having our conversation on money and politics and the world word illegal was used by <clears throat> one of the conservative guests. And yeah, he had no sense whatsoever that there was any, that was a derogatory term. And in the context of immigration, you mean? I illegal or? Yeah, it came up and along. And Lisa waited for a moment to be able to say, you know, that's not, <laughs> that's a term that is derogatory. And he, Really? And then a conversation ensued in which other options were offered because he wanted to know what he, other terminology can use. And when she said without papers, uh, one of the other conservatives said, yeah, WAP, you know, that's my family. <laughs> and, you know, every, everyone kind of got back to their immigrant roots on some level in that conversation. So it was, um, it was a good moment. That's great. Well, let's, um, let's hear from a couple people. I'm, I'm just curious what you wrote down uh, when you wrote down who you might have a living room conversation with. Is there anybody who would like to? There's a hand over there, Chris. Hi. Um, oh, I'm not touching the microphone. Sorry. I'm Jen Estreff. I have the privilege and honor of working with the Children's Alliance, and I'm their lobbyist in Olympia. So first I started writing down people that are close friends, and then I was like, I know legislators who could have these conversations, uh, maybe not on the actual floor, but um, I'm very privileged to sit with some incredible folks from One America right now who had 22 Republicans vote for the Washington State Dream Act to make sure that, uh, yeah. So, so we know the conversations are happening and as a like longtime resident of Ellensburg, Washington, which is an artsy town with a vibrant ranching and cattle community, like this is the perfect place. So now I really want to do one of these in Olympia with legislators. So I'm so awesome. excited to hear this. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. And be sure to send back information about those conversations. Uh, fantastic. Janae, we've got one over here. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, I'm Lola Peters and I am 
Um, I did the same thing of making a list of all my friends and family and stuff, and then I remembered that I am on the program committee of City Club in Seattle, and City Club intentionally builds um, a, a constituency that is from all divergent viewpoints, and so our planning committee and the board are have all kinds of different viewpoints. So mm -hmm. I have a kind of ready-made, built-in uh, place where I can pick people from. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, and, and one last one over here, uh, Janae. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm a student at Bellevue College. I'm also one of the student leaders and mentors. And uh, one person I thought of, and I'm a longtime Democrat, been one since high school. I thought one person that would uh, stir up a good conversation would be uh, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> <laughs> You're a brave man. Great. Well, you know, <laughs> th th this actually, I think, one of the things that we get to do here in making these lists um, is first of all recognizing, uh, as, as already we've heard, there are already people in our direct circles who we encounter through work or play or family uh, with whom we could engage uh, in these kinds of conversations. We just hadn't thought about it in those terms. Uh, but the second thing, which, um, you know, to the six degrees of, of, of Costner or Bacon, uh, <laughs> of, of one, one of the Kevins here, uh, is recognizing, you know, that there's incredible, incredible social science research coming out uh, uh, in our times right now. Howard Gardner this morning used the phrase new enlightenment. Uh, and uh, my co-author of Gardens of Democracy, Nick Hanauer and I, we wrote about this a little bit in that book about we live in an age where people are understanding how phenomena work uh, that are totally upending the more mechanistic views that people used to have. And one of the things that's up at being upended is this idea that I do what I do and it doesn't affect others, right? There's social science now about networks and contagions and how norms are contagious, norms of courtesy or discourtesy, norms of civility or incivility, norms of compassion or hard-heartedness, right, are incredibly contagious. And one of the things, there's a wonderful uh, social scientist uh, at, uh, at Harvard named Nick Christakis, uh, he and Jim Fowler have done this work that show that one of the greatest determinants of your happiness, or actually a bunch of uh, other metrics, your propensity for obesity, uh, your um, uh, level of civic engagement, uh, is your friend's friend's level of happiness or engagement or food healthiness. Uh, and so it's not even just the people in our immediate circles. It's the people one or two degrees removed there that end up shaping us in ways that we hardly even tangibly recognize. Uh, and I think the way that Mark and Joan described the coming together around these living room conversations is testament to that. The ways in which you all have talked about the people in your circles is testament to that as well. I invite you, and I think we all believe that apart from these lists, these lists branch out just the way that any social network branches out. And at that second and third degree are even more powerful opportunities for you to crack open spaces and conversations uh, that allow us to hear each other, to see each other, to recognize each other, to respect each other. Uh, and then from that foundation, we can do all the brawling and the combat of democracy, but we first do that foundation. Please join me in thanking Mark Meckler and Joan Blades for their example. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.